The, uh, I hope everybody's got a cup of coffee, that they're all ready to go here, the, uh, and, and that you're getting fired up. We've gotten you fired up, hopefully, about what it is you're going to do. Now we're going to sw switch gears a little bit, and I want you to get fired up about the background behind what you're going to do. Why pay attention to this? Well, because it's important, because it's interesting, because it's motivating. But, ah, you know, those are nice kind of pie in the sky stuff. When you go to your medical school or health professional school interview and you've been part, if you put on your APCAS application that you were part of the tobacco cessation study, fair game. They can ask you anything they want about tobacco cessation, about the study, about everything else. So this is going to be the didactic background. But more importantly, we want this to be where you see why it is in a very specific way, why it is what you're going to be doing in the emergency department for the next uh, semester is going to be of importance not only to you, not only to research, but most specifically to patients. Cool. Does so anybody here, at, at, I'm going to ask this about the people here at, at, at uh, St. Vincent's. Uh, anybody know who this is? Hands. Who? This is the Marlboro Man. Okay, Wayne McLaren, uh, in the 50s and 60s, this was the iconic person who sold millions and millions of cigarettes by advertising. Okay, the Marlboro Man. Specifically, oops, there it is. Specifically, Marlboro Red. Red shirt, red package, hey. Guy sold a gazillion cigarettes. This was Wayne McLaren just before he died. Wayne McLaren and two other of the Marlboro men, right? Two other of the uh, uh, the people who were models for the, the advertisements, uh, died of lung cancer. He actually testified before Congress uh, on the on the uh, how the tobacco industry manipulated advertising to get people to get addicted to uh, to cigarettes. Um, and, and the two others, it became the, the, uh, the, the Marlboro Reds became known as cowboy killers. So that was the guys. Now, women weren't, aren't excluded from all this. Um, if you were a woman in the, before the 1940s and you developed lung cancer, it was a reportable case. They would write it up in the medical literature. It never happened. In the 1940s, starting in 19, December 7th, 1941, can anybody come up with what happened that changed that? Hands. Anybody? What happened on December 7, 1941? Brandon. Yeah, Pearl Harbor. And after Pearl Harbor, all the guys in the workforce who would have been building the tanks and the airplanes and the rest of that stuff went off to war. And they needed somebody else to build those things. Who did they get? Hands. Who did they get? Alyssa. They got women. Rosie the Riveter. Right? Rosie the Riveter went into the workforce in a way that was unprecedented before that time. And when the smoke break happened at 10 o'clock, she went out with everybody else and started smoking cigarettes. Okay? Indeed, all the way through to the, the uh, 1960s and 70s, it was cool. Right? Virginia Slims, you've come a long way, baby. Here in Connecticut, there was the Virginia Slims tennis tournament. Can you imagine athletes? helping to advertise smoking. For you all, that's inconceivable. That was how it was. Here's the reality. That's what happens when you smoke. Over time, not quite as uh, iconic as the Marlboro Man, and maybe not, you have come a long way, baby, but it's not to a good place. This is the United States, where you see in, um, Tan and brown are areas where smoking, the percentage of people smoking is highest. When you see in green and lighter color here, that's less, but it's less relatively speaking, right? So look at your area where you are and note that no matter where you are, smoking is a problem. In the United States, actually, we, we, 
We thought by this time it would be what actually happens. Apparently there has been a block on putting these kind of warning labels on cigarettes. Um, you know, now you get the little warning that said just in block letters that says smoking is going to kill you. I mean, you'd think that'd be enough. But what they found was, and specifically from areas outside the United States, which have this now, and you'll see some of those, the, uh, but putting a picture on it helps a little better to see the reality. This is what you're going to be in the emergency department out there to stop. You're going to be in a massive public health campaign to make this stop. 443,000 deaths a year, nearly one in every five deaths in the United States can be directly related to tobacco use. That's more deaths than all the deaths by HIV, illegal drugs, alcohol abuse, motor vehicle injuries, suicides, and murders. You really want to change how we lower morbidity and mortality in the United States? Stop people from smoking. Not saying these things are, are, are not to be addressed, by no means, but the big, low-hanging fruit is tobacco. Tobacco deaths have been going up over time, okay? Going up. Now, driven by guys, right? Guys are smoking more uh, still. Go figure. Women have been now steady in that for an, a longer period of time, though it's still moving up in a rather uh, uh, direct kind of way. So it's not just, you can't point to somebody and, and look at them and go, well, you know, that's a guy, he's going to be the one that's smoking, or that's a gal, she's not smoking. Not that way anymore. It's, it's just as likely, which is why we're going to tell you, you want to see as many patients and visitors in the emergency department as you possibly can, because every one of them is potentially either a smoker or smoked at some time in their lives. Tobacco, whether chewed, smoked, sniffed, whatever, contains nicotine, which is highly addictive, and tobacco contains over 19 carcinogens and 4,000 chemicals. Uh, you know, who was the bright light who first went into a field someplace and said, let me see, out of all the weeds here, let me pick that one. <laughs> let's, let's pick it up, let's roll it up into a, into a you know, log thin thing, and let's light the end of it. And then let's take it into our lungs. You know, it's like the first fish that went out of water. <laughs> Why did they ever do that? But somebody did, right? And this has been the disastrous results. Go figure. Go figure. In a cigarette, right? When you take that deep into your lungs, you're bringing in lighter fluid, butane, batteries, cadmium, right? Candle wax, barbecue lighter fluid, Industrial solvent, toluene. Nicotine, the basic agent we're going to talk a lot about, they use it as an insecticide. Ammonia, a toilet cleaner, <sighs> deeper into your lungs, right? Methane or sewer gas, arsenic, which is a poison, carbon monoxide, the one I like best, methanol, rocket fuel, boom, right? And, and, and who thought? this was a good idea, right? Who thought this was a good idea? And a good idea that makes billions of dollars all around the world. Okay, we're gonna talk specifically about some of the tobacco-related pathologies. Vascular disease, respiratory disease, fetal and childhood morbidity and mortality, and then end with cancer, okay? This is to get you where you see why you are going to do what you are going to do, okay? Tobacco causes vascular disease. It's a vasoconstrictor, right? The agents in, in tobacco, which would cause hypertension and reduce blood flow to particular areas, right? If you think about a tube and you make that tube narrower and it's harder to get the blood through it, eventually you get to where not a lot of blood gets there. That's called ischemia. If you want to see what it's like, take a rubber band, okay? Put it on your finger, wrap it around a few times, right? So it's nice and tight. Roll it down to the bottom of your finger and leave it there for a while and see what happens. Now, I'm actually not suggesting this. I'm just, I want this as a metaphor. I want you to think about that, right? What's going to happen? Your finger's going to turn blue and it's going to start to hurt. And then most people would take it off. But except if that's all the blood flow that's getting there because your blood vessels are narrow, you can't take the, the rubber band off. What's the final result? 
Cigarettes cause strokes and heart disease. This is the picture that's going to be on cigarette, tobacco, cigarette uh, uh, cartons. Okay? Face the reality. Cardiovascular disease. Compared with non-smokers, smoking is estimated to increase the risk of coronary heart disease by two to four times, which is the leading cause of death in the United States, right? And stroke by two to four times. So dropping dead, the best outcome I can see from all this, versus a stroke where you can't move one side, can't talk, things like that for the rest of your life because you smoke cigarettes. Peripheral vascular disease, again, if you have the big blood vessel, now small, now small, right, to the arms or legs, causes a range of problems, both from pain, like we talked about, tissue loss, all the way to gangrene. That's what you're going to be out there to stop, right, to help somebody not have this happen to them, right? This is a, this is a, a, a foot which is not getting enough blood, and this area is necrotic, okay? This area is necrotic, that's dead. That needs to come off. That means this person will have an amputation, probably at least of his foot, potentially higher, depending upon where the blockage is. This one's not much better. It's on the same pathway, okay? Same pathway. Obstruction of the large arteries in the arms and legs, right? And then a second one, abdominal aortic aneurysm. What's that? Well, you have a blood vessel in the middle of your belly, which is a nice, thin, pristine way of blood from getting from your heart to your lower extremities, the abdominal aorta. The abdominal aorta, think about a, uh, uh, a hose that has you know, an outer covering and an inner covering, and you strip away a little piece of the outer covering, and the inside uh, uh, kind of bubble bubbles up and becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. As you increase the pressure inside of that, it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. So instead of a nice, simple blood vessel that goes down uh, nice and thin, you have a swelling that's getting bigger and bigger all the time. I want you to picture what would happen if we put a little nick in that. <laughs> blood all over your belly, right? The, the abdominal aorta, one of the biggest blood vessels in your body, is now spewing blood throughout your belly. You're going to die. Much of the time, you're going to die. Come in the emergency department, we're going to fix you, hopefully. Right? But that's what you're out to stop. Now, cigarettes cause fatal lung disease. I see some people here in Bridgeport in, in, at, uh, at St. Vincent's are kind of squirming in their chairs a little bit. Good. We want you to. Right? You need to feel this as a personal thing, a personal thing that you're going to do throughout your career in medicine to help people not have this happen. Damage to the airways and the alveoli, resulting in emphysema, chronic bronchitis under the big title of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So you have normal alveoli, kind of like little septi, very discreet here. And you can see and feel gas exchange happening in, through all those areas, all those areas, as opposed to an emphysematous lung where you've broken down that architecture and have much less area for gas exchange. So, two lungs. This is a normal lung, somebody that's died of something else besides lung disease. This is a smoker's lung. Which one do you want to have? Well, I want to have that in my body. I don't really want to have either one. But that one caused a lot more problems for a lot longer time. And you're going to help people not to have this one. Kids, infertility associated with cigarette smoking. I love this one from Canada. I mean, Canada holds no bones, right? I mean, they just put it right out there that tobacco use can make you impotent. I, just put that on the cover of, of cigarettes, and, and it's going to be a little hard to be the one that goes outside and, and, uh, and has to have a puff. Preterm births, stillbirths, low-weight babies, all things which are going to increase the morbidity and mortality of, our, of, of newly born kids, right? This isn't a kid who's going to be snuggled in mom's arms. This isn't a kid who's going home from the hospital a day after they're born to their family. This is a kid who's going to spend days and weeks and months 
in the neonatal intensive care unit, tenuous to life, instead of because mom smoked? Even something simple like otitis media. You know, if, if, if for mom, you, know, you don't have to go to the emergency room. You don't have to go to your family doctor. Take a day out of your life to, for a kid who's got an earache. Less earaches if you don't smoke, okay? So tobacco smoke can harm your children. Again, the picture on the, on the, that hopefully will be on the, uh, the uh, tobacco cartons, the cigarette cartons. Asthma and respiratory diseases, another picture. I'm a parent, I have a hard time picking up a cigarette when that picture is on the front cover of the carton that I use. Sudden infant death syndrome associated with tobacco smoking. This is what you are going to be in the emergency department for this next semester helping to prevent. I want you as motivated as possible to see as many patients and visitors in the emergency department as you possibly can because that is what you want to stop. This is what you want to stop. Smoking causes cancer. Causes all kinds of cancer, associated with all kinds of cancer. Okay, the one that we are specifically, oh sorry, I like this one. This is from Australia, right? Don't throw your cigarette ends on the floor, the cockroaches are getting cancer. <laughs> I think that's terrific. The Aussies have a great sense of humor and hopefully very effective. The one we're going to focus on is lung cancer, obviously the one that everybody associates directly with tobacco use. So again, we have our nice alveoli, okay, nice alveolar system. And for smokers, right, the lung that's destroyed and cancer. Okay, that's what you're out there for this semester preventing. This is an electron micrograph. I think it's beautiful. Right? It's, you, can, you can picture this is of, of a lung, alveolar areas of the lung. You can, you can feel the oxygen carbon dioxide exchange occurring here, right, in this really beautiful system. This is an electron micrograph of cancer. It is likewise beautiful, but in a stark and barren and desert kind of way. On the very, the very basic level, that's what you're out to prevent. It's real simple, right? All lung cancers begin as a small focus of uncontrolled cell division. Think of it this way. It's like, it's like Daytona Beach at spring break, right? It's cells gone wild, right? They just have no... No rhyme, no reason, no function. They're just gone wild. And thicken up the bronchial mucosa. So you have nice, normal, histologic micrograph of lung versus cells gone wild. Right? Where you had here, you can picture these alveoli, the gas exchange that can happen there. Nothing. Okay? You've taken whole sections out of lung that are now not going to function as normal lung tissue. It can start, what you'll be looking for when you're in internal medicine or those of you who are going to radiology or thoracic surgery, that's your baby right there, okay? That's a lung mass. That's what you'll be looking for. When you see something like that, what happens to you? They take you into a room, put you kind of to sleep a little bit, and they take this tube and they stick it down your throat. They put it into your lungs and down the, the, the trachea and through to the bronchi and out to where they think they've seen that mass. That's cancer. So this is a normal bronchogram, and that's what cancer looks like. That's what you're out to prevent. Okay, if cancer spreads, boom, goes all over. It's estimated to increase the men, men's risk of developing lung cancer by 23 times and women by 13 times. Cancer zero to, from zero to cancer in 60 seconds. Okay, how do we prevent this guy from not doing this? And they're addictive. Nicotine addiction, it's psychoactive, right? It works on your brain. It's dose-related changes in mood and feeling. And it's transient, it comes and goes. 
when it comes, it's great. When it goes, you want more. It's a euphoria. You feel better. You like it. Standard scores of, uh, on standard measures of euphoria goes up when you smoke. And it's reinforced. The more you do, the more you want it. The more you want it, the more you do. And it's neuroadaptive, meaning that it leads to tolerance and, physical, and psychological dependence. Physical addiction is as, or, uh, for tobacco, physical addiction is as the same potential as morphine. My mom was smoked for a gazillion years until she had a stroke. I used to tell her, Mom, you know, you're like a heroin addict. She didn't take really good, she took a little offense when I said that. But it's true. You have the same addiction as if to morphine. And the psychic dependence of cocaine. Never having used either of these substances, actually none of the three of these substances, I can't tell you what it feels like personally, thank God. But those who use cocaine have said that it is, it is so wonderful in what it feels like, they just want more. Same for smoking, okay? It happens the same for, the pharmacokinetics for nicotine are the same for uh, smokeless as for smoking tobacco, which is why we have you asking questions about things like uh, snuff and chew. Tobacco cessation, we, I'll be honest with you, we don't know much about how to help people to stop smoke, smoking, right? Stop using tobacco. We go to the experts, so we go to publicly available guidelines as to how to do it. So the rest of what you're going to see here about tobacco cessation, that's all up to uh, what other people tell us. We're about implementation. How do we implement this for huge numbers of people? Okay. What the guidelines say. Every patient who uses tobacco should be offered at least one of these treatments. Those who are willing should be able to have some way to be able to quit. Those who are not willing to try to quit now have the, a brief intervention which says, here's the ways that you can do this in the future. So even when you have somebody who does not want the quit line, which is what the study's going to be about, it is also a positive piece because you've made them aware. The more times they're made aware in a uh, healthcare setting, the more likely they are at some time in the future to stop. It should be institutionalized so that it is consistent. Identification, documentation, and treatment of every Tobacco users seen in a healthcare setting, like the emergency department. Only we're, as clinicians, we're too busy because we're taking care of the patients, right? We have to, um, we have to be able to do that. But you're there. You could do that. And we're going to help to show you how. Brief treatment should be effective, offered to every patient who uses tobacco. And the one that you are going to be involved with are quit lines. Quit lines are uh, phone-based, free tobacco cessation programs, which have been shown to be effective. They are mandated by tobacco settlement funds. Right? Tobacco companies got to fund things to help people stop using their product. Hey, go figure, right? What a world. The, uh, about 30 to 40 percent of the time, if you, if you do a, a program, you'll be effective in stopping smoking. There's a strong relationship between the intensity of the dependence counseling and its effectiveness. So there's all different kinds. Person to person, group, telephone counseling fits into this, which we're talking about. Shown to be consistently effective. And it increases with the intensity. There's also things that they do within this program, which is about practical counseling, skills, here's what you do instead of smoking, provision of social supports as treatment, and then help in securing the supports outside of the treatment program itself. What do we found to be the most effective? Kids, right? Who helps mom and dad to stop smoking? Kids. Why are you doing that? Mommy, that smells terrible. Daddy, why are you doing something? They tell me that's gonna kill you. Pretty effective, okay, pretty effective. Okay, there are pharmacotherapies. You can actually go out and get nicotine. You can start a program on your own. Get out of CVS or the pharmacy in your area Right? Get one of these things. And they've been shown to be effective. As well as antidepressants that can be very effective as well. Okay? Except in contraindications, they should be offered to all patients, which is the way the quit line can make this happen. It's all about money, lots of ways. We're going to bang through these because 
they're on your, they'll be on your slides and available to you. About 20 years ago, data indicated that clinicians too frequently fail to intervene with their patients who smoke. Why? In the 50s, these were commercials that were in national magazines, right? Doctors promoting smoking. Go figure. It wasn't just guy doctors either. I mean, you know, it was women doctors as well. Recent data confirms that hasn't changed markedly over the past two decades. That's the sad part. Now, before we start jumping up and down about that, recognize that preventive efforts versus taking care of the problem you came to see your physician about makes a difference. But in a recent survey, only 15% of smokers who saw a physician in the past year were offered assistance with quitting, were offered a quitline referral. Only 3% were given a follow-up. Wait a second. Half the U.S. population goes to an emergency department every year. They spend four hours. There's 500,000 kids a year want to go to medical school and, help, and, and never mind all the other health professional schools. What happens if we put all those things together? We can do better. We can do better. Because there we have time, we have opportunity, and we have personnel who see this as something that they can do to their, your benefit. So bottom line, there's lots of ways to help people to stop smoking. It's effective. They can be appropriate for the primary care setting, and I'd offer that the primary care setting, like the emergency department, is, I mean, the emergency department is the potential there to be a primary care setting in that, in that sense. And cessation can be cost effective for other than reimbursed clin other clinical interventions. You know, don't have a thoracotomy to open up your chest and take out your lung cancer with radiation and chemo and a fair chance you're going to die. Put that money into stopping smoking at the beginning, and you don't have all that stuff at the end. The impact can be increased by supportive health care policies. Maybe this is a health care policy. Research associates walking into the uh, patients and visitors in the emergency department and asking them these kinds of questions and helping them to get referred to a client if they want to stop can be very effective. I'm two-thirds done. I've got two-thirds of the things I have to do today with you all are done. What I'd like to do now, and I'm, I'm just looking back to the chiefs, should we do questions now? How do we want to do this? Yes? Questions. So we're going to have questions here from uh, St. Vincent's and from programs around the country. Cool. Now, I have a rule here at the Research Associates Program at St. Vincent's. We don't stop till we have at least three questions. Okay, that's the rule. Remember we said we gotta follow rule. That's a rule. Okay, the other, the other side of that rule is that, that doctors are not shy. Right? Doctors are not shy. Okay, I need three questions. Start from here and then we'll take the ones from elsewhere. Please, and that's Ryan's. Great question. And that's variable for what you talk about normal, okay? And I'm not the expert to answer that question. Um, and, and I've seen them, the, the data, how soon, your, how soon your respiratory function gets better, how soon you lower your risk for heart disease, how long it takes before you lower your risk for having cancer. I just don't know them off the top of my head to be able to answer that. But they are all there, right? So, so even if you smoke for a long time, it's still better to stop. Right? You know, use my mom as the example. She'll never see this, so that's okay. I can talk about it. Right? You know, it took something really bad to happen, but her lung functions got better. She's never had another episode of, of, uh, uh, of stroke symptoms, and thank God they all resolved. No heart attacks, no other things like that. She's, I won't tell you how old she is. Even, even, even I can't say that to a place that the national people are looking at. She's doing really well. Great question. Number two. Shyness, shyness. Oh my goodness. You gotta have some question out there. Yeah, please, Joshua. What are you gonna do? The question is, are we gonna be looking into who smokes as well? Oh, hookah, I'm sorry, not who, hookah. Um, Great question. Um, 
off the top of my head, I'm thinking about how the data is there. That would be other, right? Yeah, I'm looking at the Chiefs. Again, the Chiefs run everything. The, uh, yeah, hookah would be other. So yeah, and again, what you're going to see and you're going you're to learn specifically in, the, uh, in practice this afternoon is when in doubt, write it out. We have a lot of sayings in the Research Associates program. When in doubt, write it out. So other is a way that you write out. You know, it doesn't fit into one of the ticky-tacky little boxes. Great. Then we as the data analyzers, we as the ones who are responsible for the study itself, uh, we, we, will, we will be the ones who have to figure out how to analyze that. So the more, if, if you have a question and you don't think it's something you need to talk to a, a chief about, how do I do this, you know, it's just another piece of data, write it in. Let us know. Don't guess. Write it down. Right? We can handle it. If we know what the data is going in, we can handle it. If it's a guess, we don't know that. We can't use that. That's bad science. Great. Two questions. One more. Please. And that's um, Kathleen. There you go. Great question. What Kathleen was asking about is what about dependency on the agent, nicotine or antidepressants, uh, and, and being addicted to that? Am I correct? Is that analyzed pretty well? A couple of sides to that. One, it's a lot easier to stop when you don't have all the other things that are going on, smoke going into your lungs, having a cigarette in your hand, all the other things that go along with that. Two. Nicotine specifically is designed about, you know, the patch gets smaller. You know, at the end of the first week, it's a big patch that covers your arm, and the next week, and the next week until you don't need the patch anymore. That's the idea. Three, um, it still is better for you, right? It's better than taking in everything else that a cigarette does, the butane, toluene, meth, uh, whatever all that stuff was, right, into your lungs than having just the one agent that goes transdermally. Okay, so it's a, it would be better if it was cold turkey, but it's harder. Some people do cold turkey, right? The, uh, uh, but this is the next best step. Be a way to think about it, I think. Okay, cool, good. All right. What do we got, Chiefs? We're gonna make, so, uh, Okay, five minutes.